Namaste. Welcome to the Charoka podcast. I've got a big one for you today. My guest today is Dr. Karan Jani. Dr. Karan Jani is a postdoctoral research fellow in astrophysics and a member of the LIGO scientific collaboration. His primary research focuses on astrophysical black holes and testing Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. He was a part of a global team of scientists who helped discover the existence of gravitational waves, which was awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. Dr. Jani also shares research interests on the inter interface of space diplomacy and big data science with national security pol policies. He's also a co-recipient of the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, MacArthur Foundation's Senator Sam Nunn Fellowship in National Security and a Distinguished Student Travel Award from the American Physical Society. Uh, you must have seen videos of uh, Dr. Jani meeting the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, and the famous selfie he, he took with uh, the Prime Minister. So without further ado, uh, welcome to the podcast, Karan. Uh, I really want to thank you. Uh, I'm having a minor, minor fanboy moment right now. So if, uh, if everybody sees me blushing a little bit, please forgive me. This means a lot to me. So thanks a lot for doing this. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was really an honor to be here. So Karan, first, uh, let's start with your background. Uh, so can you tell us uh, a bit about how, you know, how did you get interested in physics or why would you get interested in science? So, you know, go for it. Yeah. So it, I mean, it's not something like, you know, I was catered to. I was not from a family which had any science graduates. So I didn't, it wasn't sort of a natural inclination towards doing physics. I think the natural inclination was towards more um, spirituality or philosophy. Because that was the kind of uh, you know, discussions uh, that my grandfather uh, sort of have every day at dining table. And it was very early in the life uh, facing that sort of existential question. What's our bigger purpose? Why we do all this that we do? And then we humans live with a time bomb that is attached to us. Um, so before it takes off, uh, what are we sort of supposed to do? And this question sort of really puzzles, especially when you're at adolescent age. Um, I think he was trying to find a rational answer, you know, whether you find it reading uh, you know, Advaitya philosophy, whether you find it reading uh, some or the other thinker of the time but then physics just perfectly rested on it like as soon as i learned about uh, astronomy like a basic astronomy right this is galaxy this is stars it sort of just blows apart the entire perspective like you know you are sort of concerned about oh this is my life and what do i make out of it blah blah and then you see the scale of the universe and you realize like oh man this is this is much larger than you know anything's gonna happen so then you are more sort of the existential crisis goes reverse way then then you are just in truth like why what is this grand structure and uh, just then knowing bits and pieces of that uh, right now as humanity the only way we understand the universe right now is through physics like, i mean that is the uh, because we want to have a perspective which is independent of us humans stars like all the forces in the universe all the structure that is is gonna be there independent of humans are here or not uh, so that is somehow you know felt like this is this is a legacy to be part of because i don't want to have my conclusions about the universe biased by any of my human limitations cool so uh, I want to start, obviously, my first question to you would be that you know, you're known for the LIGO scientific collaboration. So uh, how would you explain what, what was the LIGO scientific collaboration? What exactly was it looking to prove? And if, you know, let's say, you know, the average Joe on the street, if the average Joe on the street in India, you know, say, let's say you're from Baroda. So somebody in Baroda, they, they approach you and they say, Karan, please tell me what does LIGO mean and what did you guys do and how would you go about it and what exactly did we end up proving? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer and Gravitational Laser Observatory. It's essentially a telescope. Um, it's a telescope that was looking for a particular kind of signal that Einstein had predicted in 1915. 
and the signal is gravitational waves um, and uh, we always i mean gravity is part of us we face it every day since the time we wake up from our bed but we don't tend to think about gravity as waves you know, because the interaction that we have around gravity is literally touching our feet so we are too close to it but imagine the interaction between sun and earth so light takes 8 minutes from sun to reach earth so if tomorrow an alien comes and takes our sun away would we still be in orbit around the center and the answer is for 8 minutes because it would take also gravity 8 minutes to reach us so in that sense gravity is some form of a wave or continuum um and it gets a little more uh, nuanced uh, in the context of general relativity where gravity is essentially the space time fabric it is the stage on which the whole universe lies and now in that space time i mean we tend to think it's a flat the euclidean geometry kind of but it is not you could change the geometry uh so this all funky things einstein had predicted in 1915 and for the longest time it was this i mean including himself he thought that it, you cannot detect all this thing right in theory it makes all sense um, and it was only in 70s onwards when uh, people started making um like plausible designs like can you go ahead and look at it but the question is why do you want to look at it and the the answer are twofold one is as we now understand uh, only 2% of the universe emits electromagnetic radiation so every conventional telescope form of communications that we have is only representative of 2% the 98% universe absolutely does not communicate in electromagnetism but because it is still on the space time fabric it leaves its imprint so even if dark matter does not radiate electromagnetism dark matter still is impacted by gravity right uh, so to understand the universe we had to understand this waves we had to detect this waves that's one reason the second reason was um the confusion between quantum mechanics and general relativity right it's just growing day by day and there is neither of the theory shows any level of um uh, cracks that you can fill it up with a bigger theory but the thing about general relativity it's just not tested right it was not tested till 2015 like we knew mathematical is the most elegant beautiful piece of work out there any time humanity has made it is outstandingly profound um but we didn't know how to really test it to the limit so all this force people do really think you know can we detect gravitation waves and uh, ligo was the first successful and so far the only successful experiment to detect gravitational waves uh and it took a while it took almost three generation of scientists so i am fortunately the first generation of scientists who has seen the detection at such an early age oh otherwise yeah. every mentor that i had had lived their entire adult life looking for gravitational waves so my first uh, undergraduate advisor under whom i published my first paper and as my mentor since so he was a phd student of kip thorn and uh, kip ended up then winning this last year's nobel prize in physics uh, for ligo so it could just see this long has been the procedure um and yeah so essentially uh, what we found was this first signal uh, the first confirmed signal gravitational waves come and hit earth since the time of dinosaurs and beyond but the first time when humanity could sort of essentially say yes this friction of second it came this is what it looked like this is where it came from uh, that all we were able to prove and uh, that why it was such a big breakthrough okay now i want to connect this to the larger discussion with physics in general so uh, again i'm giving you the perspective of a, a person from a non scientific background so you know we would learn in school or you grow up like i have a habit of i try to read 
papers in science. But what I find is, is it's like if it's a paper in evolution or in biology on chemistry, you know, there is there is certainty. Like I know this is going where, you know, how did we evolve from single cell organism to what we are today and and the you know the various stages we've passed through. But since my childhood and, and uh, I consider myself to be someone who and tries to understand science relatively better. But even when I try to read a physics paper, you know, I'll be the first one to admit that I I, I feel so dumb when I'm doing, doing you know, reading a physics paper. Uh, all, you know, at the, the moment, if you tell the average person physics, you know, the oh, first image that comes into their mind is a lot of numbers, a lot of numbers going all over the place. And, and then they get kind of scared and intimidated about it. So how do you think we can sell physics at, at, at a conceptual level to the larger masses to understand it better. Yeah, I mean, see, about certain things about uh, sciences in general and not particularly physics is that we tend to communicate with human languages, but we don't do science with human language. In physics, you only do with math. That is only up to a point where semantically I could explain. I mean, after that, even I, my intuition also resides on mathematics. If you ask me what, um, what does time mean near a black hole? I mean, I could try to put it in words, but if I see the expression, it becomes sort of more clear to me. You know, whoever is sort of with me to explain. That's one part. The second is, I look at physics more as the way we see uh, Shastri Sandhi. It's um, it's a very nuanced framework. Um, there are parts of it which are absolutely abstract and mysterious, but so beautiful. When you are able to connect with reality, even if it seems so starkly abstract. You know, sing a rag in a particular time. It does evoke a mood. And how does it happen? I mean, how does sa random samples of sound hitting your eardrum generate the mood which goes with uh, the surrounding? So in the same sense, you know, the frameworks of physics uh, are now evolved to the point where if you want to understand nature and by any form of nature, I mean, from the point of how does your organs behave, I mean, you call it biology, but at the end when you keep digging deeper and deeper, the answer to everything in our universe resides in physics. Um, it is the most fundamental um, sort of chart of our human knowledge. Everything else is derived from it. So it's essentially, um, I mean, I, I don't sell it in the sense that it's not something like I give a career and I don't know, become a physicist. No, I mean, if you have that deep down urge to find truth and by truth, this T capital truth, you know, the fundamental truth, then this is the path you take. And that is physics. So, so I've always found this uh, with uh, people who are involved in the subject of physics. You know, uh, physics uh, demands this overwhelming capacity uh, to think outside the box and uh, mix it up with a lot of abstract thinking. So I guess, uh, uh, would you consider those to be two fundamental uh, prerequisites if you want to get into it? Yeah, so out of box thinking, I mean, again, I don't see it just specific to something in physics. I think a lot of problems in computer science, especially now in the days of AI and ML, are also in the same league. Um, what is particularly about physics is there are two things. So one is the you have to keep making mistakes and going further and further in your curiosity. So you start with a curiosity and then you approach it and then your approach would fail and flatter down and then you will find someone else's approach. And then you're trying to modify it further and further uh, to best represent uh, uh, the reality. And that's so it is really that process of trial and error is what I define as physics. And uh, it's the second thing I had in my mind and I just sort of forgot about it. Yeah, and the second thing is it's a very, um, you cannot, there is no instant gratification in physics. I mean, 
sometimes you feel like oh you are done with a bachelor's now you should have a job no you are done with a masters now you should be done no you still haven't done your phd you still haven't done your post doc even if you are done your post doc there is still like you are just there yet it's just such a long overwhelming process to reach any gratification that yes i have achieved there are people who the kipton is one such example and rainer wise who also won the nobel prize they have lived for 50 years doing something that were constantly told it's undetectable and so did their students and they have been their students uh, so when i wanted to do my phd and i had asked uh, that year's nobel prize winner in physics when i was applying and even at that level he said that You know, you should not, because finding gravitational waves is like finding aliens. Even if they exist, it's very unlikely to prove it in human lifetime. Wow, that's fascinating. Now, you know, just this little anecdote and the story, you know, uh, makes us realize the significance of uh, what you guys achieved. You know, when uh, in the LIGO Science collaboration. Now, I want to shift to, uh, you know, Bharat Varsh. Now. You know, obviously right now you're outside india but you know as an indian you're a keen observer of uh, this the the emanation of information regarding to science in india and uh, i i i read uh, your blog post and and the article you had written about you know the how science and its uh, education in, when it comes to mainstream media outlets or let's say print journalism in india is is very very uh, i don't know what word i should use i'm very careful when i use words so uh, you know it's it's below par uh, if i was to say like i'll give you an example as a uh, average consumer of news if i was to put up a tv channel i can scan through you know hindi news channels and english news channels i don't remember the last time that i literally found an hours program where i had a non shouting and screeching anchor and three mm. to four subject matter specialists just mm. talking about some deep concepts it does not have to be physics i mean i'm talking about physics chemistry biology or artificial intelligence or anything of that sort i uh, there is none so uh, as someone who's probably now rated as the top 30 thinkers in, in the world how do you feel about that when you look at the state of affairs in your own home nation yeah Yeah, I mean it's always saddening, and I distinctly remember um, when we had the LIGO discovery, right? And I was very cynic that nobody in India would sort of, you know, like, uh, I mean, in India, in the sense like the students and everyone, of course, are always excited, and that's great to see. Uh, but by and large, the uh, society would remain indifferent to it. Uh, fortunately, I was proved wrong to an extent that at least everyone in India, to an extent, celebrated. Uh, the fact that LIGO discovery happened, and a lot of that also goes to the credit that uh, the Prime Minister announced LIGO India project. So there was an added enthusiasm for everyone to learn why the Prime Minister all the way tweeted about something, right? So I think it him doing it really sort of added the catal catalyst there. But you, as you said, right about the coverage of science. You know, the thing is now I just realized when you're speaking, it's not that news media doesn't do it. It's not the news like regular channels do it. We don't even have YouTubers. We don't even have Amazon Prime's or Netflix specials. I mean, anything like that is nowhere that you have science discussion in the nation, which is 1.2 billion people um, and highest number of STEM graduates in the world, and we still don't have uh, such sort of in uh, celebration of science as we would have hoped for. Um, and i don't know i mean what where to sort of put the blame initially i i was very uh, it was very funny so when we had the announcement and uh, i was really wanting to speak to as many people as i could like oh, you know why this is ground breaking or chatting and there was times when i had uh, someone from media saying oh we'll try to publish this and then next day they would have some dharna in jnu and then that would overshadow the fact that uh, Oh, the discovery of this the scale so perhaps you know the things that we are agitating for the things we are it's perhaps as we have still not reached um 
by and large discussion into the space where we talk about ideas when we in, we have problems around us which could be only solved by science and technology every problem that india has can only and only be solved by science and technology so we have to have a discussion on how 3d printers could help farmers that is some conversation that if not happening in dining tables then it should be happening in college canteens we have to have a way to know how machine learning artificial intelligence can help uh, you know everything for us from farming sector to uh, much more nuanced like uh, banking and all uh, but the fact that we get we're just so occupied with other thoughts <laughs> every day when we wake up there are just so many other things which becomes newspaper headlines which take your mind away from ideas and then just make you agitated uh, so i don't know i mean i i try and sort of i feel like perhaps this is not the epoch to do it yeah it 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 hurts me as an indian and as a person who's so you know is i'm personally really invested in science because you know like you said uh, you know like my, one of my friends uh, a while you know they'll tell me why are you so weird why do you keep thinking all the time i was like aren't all of us supposed to be thinking all the time aren't we all at the end of the day you know i still remember that carl sagan you know image if you remember from the cosmos where carl sagan goes this small pale blue dot that's all we are and how can it how can that image not move anyone for that matter is something that i don't wrap my head around now let us look at the culture in india you know you're born and raised in india i'm born and raised in india it's okay you were in gujarat i was in maharashtra but at the end of the day when the report card used to come from the school you know which marks used to matter the most for our parents maths mein kitne aaye science mein kitne aaye batao and, and everybody's parents is obsessed with the marks in maths and science for a culture that is so obsessed with the marks in maths and science what the hell is wrong with us why, why aren't we discussing the same subjects on the te- television news then yeah and we have replaced it with also things which are sort of disturbing right i mean now um and it is true i mean uh, organizations quote on quote spiritual uh, has a higher budget now to them than isro has just that that's funny part right? uh, it is people's money and i mean whether we put it in tax and then fund sciences so i am tax payers funded in the science that i do and that's why i think it's a particular responsibility that every scientist has is to go ahead and communicate like look i i mean we would not have discovered collisions of black holes before even the start of humanity not humanity sorry before even start of life on planet earth if it was not for your hard earned tax money that allowed me to comfortably be in the science labs and do that research so i have to eventually get out and tell you like look you guys made this discovery possible um so i mean that that sort of connection is just somehow not there now for us so uh, uh, do you have uh, something in mind like i'll give you a very specific example again let's move on to print journalism let's if in print at least you have the science section you know let's say times of india will have its science you know at least one page of scientific uh, discoveries or what but even within that uh and i'm recall you know i'm trying to recall your tweet uh, you know when once you had tweeted about a paper that was published and basically that paper was substandard and even the science journalism in india when when you try and read an article right now you can't expect the average citizen to go and like okay i'm going to go to google citations i'm going to go on google read the original paper try and understand that complicated scientific jargon then kind of cross verify with the science paper article mentioned in these newspapers i mean if you look at the science reportage to the language and and the the you know the, hindi mein kehte hai na ki humne ek paper ka nichod nikalna hai 
जब हम निचोड़ निकाल के उसको प्रस्तुत भी करते हैं पेपर में दैट इट सेल्फ इज सो लो नाउ वेर वेर हैज दिस गॉन रॉन्ग डू यू थिंक इट हैज लॉट लॉट टू डू विद क्लिक बेट कल्चर दैट वी आर इन टूडे दैट यू नो लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स हैव टू बी इवन साइंटिफिक पेपर विच आर सो न्यूस्ड Uh, are kind of presented in a very clickbaity way so I, the clickbait thing is sort of which is universal in the sense that i mean it exists everywhere now but what is still um that's when i actually get a lot of my uh, news about science from it's new york times science section uh, i feel beyond physics if i have to learn about the scientific american quantum magazine and all this uh, I, I think one of the problems that happens is for so long that we have not been concerned about reporting science. Uh, that now it is to the stand that you know even we have to release a press release. The press release and the media reads, and then the media decides you know if they want to put it in the tenth page, the second page, or not to cover it at all. and now in this culture of press releases um, and there is also a element of pr to it uh, there are some papers uh, not that papers I and mean, i don't even qualify them as journals where they are published but they would make a statement like and i actually read it and that's why i tweeted that geeta can cure diabetes reading geeta can cure diabetes right and that was times of india front page um and i have read and i remember it so uh, Like after knocking so in like I mean this is the scientific discovery we have done this is Nobel Prize we they report something right don't have to have my quotes just report it uh, and even uh, then there will be a hard ticket there will be a hesitation oh actually this is a very classic thing I had I won't name the news channel but uh, just after meeting the prime minister meeting the prime minister in Washington DC then um, uh, the MEA spokesperson asked that we interact with media and one of the media channels. Uh, popular one say that you will be on air you know like to explain so i was like so excited i like texted my mom and dad like be in front of the tv we're going to have discussion i was like late night it was i think almost like 12 in india by then and then we are waiting 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 and then the reporter came and said that india lost a asia cup game or uh, some champions trophy game so sorry we are not going to be covering this news now and i was like if at this stage in washington dc when we meet the pm and we are there to tell the country men look you know how important we are going to go further if we build some observatory like this in india and in that you wait against a cricket tournament now i think that just sets the premise <laughs> in uh, all i can say is you know as a fellow indian you can only hang your head in shame now you know you touched upon this this particular incident where you mentioned you know geeta curing diabetes now you know, it bugs me so much you know, some day somebody will say i can cure aids then somebody hops in and says you know some minister will come and say and let's not take the names here but the point is is cutting across political outfits this is no this is no unique phenomena to one particular somebody will say oh you know uh, i can cure homosexuality or it is a disease and then somebody will say and no oh, you know evolution is not true and you just keep listening to this and the fun fact is if you look at surveys in india you know majority of indians will actually buy you know the the claim of evolution and obviously you know we are taught that in school we are not taught creationism in india but how how does one handle this situation where i mean i get worried when somebody who's relatively you know related to my policy making starts getting into the look you you are in the realm of real politic policy making you de- deal in those levels but why would you want to start commenting on things and and then then some random guru or the some random priest or some random molvi comes and makes these these extraordinary statements so how do we handle it see obviously aggression is not the answer uh, the, an- the the solution always lies in dialogue but my question to you would be as a scientist is how would you rec- you know guide us in, in engaging with these people yeah yeah so it's It's always the same thing even to me, and every time someone makes it. Uh, but I also partially blame the media here in the sense they only pick up science to put up political fights. 
So they would pick science and say like, look, this guy said that, this person said that. They would not use science to say, look, this discovery also happened from India. Because that's when you would be going to say, nah, nah, nah. if you want to discuss um, anything related to how research is happening, you go to a corridor like JNU and say, look, look, research scholars are on strike. Like that is the only angle that suits the narrative. Not the fact that you have other top institutions in the world that are in the country who are part of this discovery doing science with us. And then when they pick up, let's say, if, uh, against particularly this government, they would pick statements by you know, some chief minister or some minister, overshadowing that actually a lot of interesting science policy making has happened in the last four years. You know, I think it's one of the very, it's a tragedy that, you know, neither. Um, Neither side could communicate this well, like how much we have invested in science. Uh, I think the hope is that perhaps you know now uh, going forward, uh, government or policymakers in general. Now I think you cannot really curb everyone to not say what they feel. Like I've had this incredible occasion when I met uh, with one of the. Uh, one of the very important politicians in Gujarat and uh, explained to him you know this discovery had happened and he he was just puzzled that this is a discovery to begin with and uh, he just said but you know uh, uh, you know in Ved is already written that you know in Brahma when he sort of uh, blinked his eyes uh, we had sort of this relativity and you know, the sage story and uh, <laughs> So, I mean, you can't really go and sort of bar everyone. And if he said that in on a podium in which I was an uh, uh, attendee, then I still would not sort of be shocked now. Because yeah. this is what, by and large, is the discussion of society. This is what the society is. You won't be able to curb it unless until you really put it at the level of schools now. You know, one of the trainings that we don't give students is really how to find bluff. I mean, that's like, and especially in today's era of WhatsApp, like students have to have the ability to debunk things. Only then they could be uh, rational citizens. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> you, you raise such an important point about you know teaching people critical thinking, and I, I want to connect to the previous uh, thing you you, know, you mentioned Brahma's eyes uh, blinking, and and I was trying to control my laughter because th this bothers me. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm sure both you and I we take a lot of pride in our civilizational continuity and our civilization's past. We both of us are proud Indians, and we are proud of our civilization. And you know the point is that there are significant real achievements that our ancestors made in math or in metallurgy or or in a different sciences that that we can take pride in now this is what bothers me when instead of doing that all you hear is are our ancestors knew everything our ancestors made the plane our ancestors you know they had their uh, internet they they discovered the double helix even before we knew the double helix and uh, you know big bang is mentioned here that is mentioned there now the point is yeah, I, now some points are true, like the, you know, the age of the car, you know, the age of the, you know, the universe, actually, you know, you can say that our ancestors literally predicted almost the same. And, and I tell you from where I remember this, it was from Carl Sagan's Cosmos. And I remember that 10 minute segment where Carl Sagan says, you know, the Hindus got it right and, and all that. I, I remember that, but at the end of the day, there has to be humility, any claim made by any set of books at the end of the day has to be subject to verification in some way or the other. Now, when you make such, you know, ridiculous claims, I mean, I don't have any other word other than ridiculous. It, it really harms the great Indian civilization where, which had some serious discoveries like in mathematics. So, so how does one react? I mean, how, I just want to know, see, I am not a scientist. I'm not as smart as you. I'm probably not even one hundredth of your intellect. I feel irritated. What must you be going through is, is what I'm not trying to understand. So how do you feel personally when you hear things like this? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you know, like uh, whether um, whatever our stance is, I mean, it does not have to be connected whether, you know, we are proud about our citizenship or you know, civilization. Absolutely, we are. And whether or not we sort of go ahead and 
counter this that should not be even put into a certificate uh but that said um you know the what we tend to miss is the fact that right now as of today onwards in the scale of 100 years also we have done so much you know there has been a ramanujan there has been a subramanyam chandrashekhar there has been c v vishweshwara i um, mean all this uh, legendary names have originated from us and uh, uh, we don't even we tend to not even remember this close by history of all this you know, like the when ligo discovered and what we have discovered so far not only we have proved einstein right we have also proved the lifelong work of chandrashekhar right you know what chandrashekhar predicted what is the smallest size a star can have and after which it collapses to become a neutron star after which it becomes a black hole that is also proved in the process cv vishweshwara made phenomenal work I and mean, it's like as pioneering as one can make in general relativity um and he did it back in 70s uh, that was also verified in in the process so uh we gloss over that and then we go run the clock 2000 years 3000 years and back Uh, and it's it's funny you know how how does this whole process work but it, i think one of the fundamental reason is that we don't have uh, spokespersons of science we don't have science thinkers speaking out loud we would have every other every other gully has a so called godman and uh, and it's honestly if i am there to speak or in fact any nobel prize winner is there to speak um, the crowd we would attract is 100th of a crowd that one uh someone who would, and they would still talk about truth about nature about reality in some sense and not at all close to it uh, but then we as society have sort of accepted that this is the only way we are going to gain the higher wisdom quote on quote yeah uh I want to touch upon another very interesting uh, article and blog that I read on your website too. That uh, and you know, I I, I actually wanted to uh, get your views uh, once again. I mean, obviously, people if somebody would not have read it, so I want you to talk about it. You wrote specifically about the role of women in science in India and mm-hmm. what we can do about it. So, so I want you to speak a little bit about that because I think it's a very important subject that you touched upon in your article. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's it's uh, it's very saddening um, that when we look at our top national institutes in the country, top policy making, there was actually a picture of all the heads of um, national IITs and IIMs and stuff who had met with the president. And you see that picture, and there is not a single female in the picture. Um, and uh, I am, I'm sure, I mean uh, just an adult, an it. From a from a point of an anecdote, and every one of us remembers that when we were in school, for most schools, the toppers in my class at least were always female, um, right? So they were. I mean, in my batchmates, were smarter than me. They were hardworking than me, more disciplined. But then somewhere, the society did not sort of allow them to precipitate at the same length as it did to the men. Uh, so it's a problem. It's a definitely a global problem but it is a very much existing in india and it matters more for india because in our ethos um i mean we have such a high young uh, resources and in that it is very important that we build role models that everyone can associate with right like i coming from gujarat is something that a gujarati boy who is also like me studied in gujarati medium state board school could look up to and say that you know it could be possible the same sense you also need a female scientist across the board you know when we look at hima das all of us feel that pride that yes this is our athlete the same weight has to hold for also sciences we need to have human examples we don't want to know that the i mean the sure i mean you could keep having a I mean, the fictional goddesses and and stuff, and that way of one representation of them. But I think it's very important to have um, uh, the real scientist being portrayed. And as a just test, you know, ask any top ten IIT 
J. Rankers to name five female Indian scientists? Yeah, I, I'm sure you'll not get an answer in heck, man. Uh, I, I, you know, always do this test with the IIT, IIM types. I just tell them name five top science journals in India. And believe me, the answers are not very pretty. So it, it's kind of weird. Uh, I mean, it, it's also reflective on, you know, the, um, so what only 25% of total intake scenarios are female. And that has to do with many reasons. I mean, particularly uh, the coaching classes and all this culture has made it more male centric that whole thing now um, i have been re very fortunate that my current postdoc advisor uh, my phd advisor half of my ph more than half of my phd committee are all top notch female physicists so i have almost now i mean in the setting that i am there is no barrier now who's a male who's a female right I mean, we it's just has reached that level of utopia um, and when i see that it is not such the case in india and you know the kind of uh, i have friends who are in working in mnc's r and d and even there the kind of sentiment that exists you know, that a woman should not be in this kind of uh, intense lab space and blah blah it is it is almost laughable now you know it is so affecting that now you don't even know and these are the people who go now with you mm. and this is the perspective they share uh, i mean it, it just hurts and uh, that's why one has to campaign for it that uh, there is nothing specific about a male being being a physicist versus a female being a physicist you know just doing the science but you have to project role models and more than ever, India needs it now. If you want to solve the problems that we are facing, you need to have you know, female role models in front of you, uh, and specifically in sciences. So I was very glad to meet one such, um, Professor Shubhatulip. Uh, we both gave TED Talk together, uh, and uh, we had some very brief conversations about this. And I, I, I was, I mean, Almost like I had my fan body in the sense of, wow, I'm such an accomplished scientist. And she's still a mother of two children and been able to sort of communicate science at a global stage. Yeah, I, 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 I always say this, you know, we, we have a problem in India where we sometimes I think we worship the false gods <laughs> to use uh, that term. And I think we need to change our heroes. And when we change our heroes, we change the society. And, and I sincerely believe that in you, you are that hero that we have now for, you know, we are a young country. So I I hope that, you know, with you, we will correct the mistakes of our past and you, you truly become that hero. Now, I want to jump into two very specific questions because uh, if somebody comes to my podcast, which is the Charvaka podcast, they have to understand some scientific thing or some scientific concept from a scientist. So uh, I was reading a book by Lee Smolin. Again, uh, most of it, uh, you know, the dummy that I am went above my head. So I, you know, now that I have someone like you on my podcast, I wanted to make the most of this opportunity to get your views. So, so what do you make of Smolin's idea of the Evo Devo uh, universe? So, so uh, for the viewers who are going to be watching it, or the listeners who are going to be, you know, only on the audio only podcast, so I would request you to first kind of explain what you know the Evo Devo universe by Smolin is, and uh, what are your personal views on that, and then we can shift to the next question that I wanted to ask you. Oh, so it's, so it's I've, I've been in Lee Smolin's group uh, for a while. I was at a visiting scholar at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, and I was in Smolin's group. Uh, it's um, a very engaging human being. Uh, it's always fun to have chat with him. Uh, he has uh, strong views on a lot of things in science. Um, partially, that sort of anti string theory movement that he has is started. I don't know what specifically the universe that you mentioned. Uh, is that the cyclic universe? 
Okay. It's the cosmology of the universe, you know, the cosmological evolution, uh, evolution at a cosmological uh, level, uh, how we have evolved at the cosmological level. That's what he's talking about. So, so that, that I, I'm talking about that very specific part of it, where he, you know, he says that uh, black holes may be mechanisms of universe reproduction within the multiverse or an extended cosmological environment, uh, you know, where universes will grow, die keep coming in and and it was all uh, related to that so i wanted to know about that yeah. Oh. Yeah. i i mean i get the gist so it's just this specific school of thought about to explain the why the universe is the way it is it's an anthropological principle way of saying um and first of all and why like so the four forces we have why gravity is the weakest you know the universe. why is the constants the way the constants are speed of light only being this why is it so and in fact none of if you break any of that if you try to alter it you would not come to humanity you simply cannot evolve so it seems that the universe uh, has been fine-tuned but why would it be fine-tuned and then there could be postulates of other phenomenon explaining it random phenomena it all sounds very nice. I mean, uh, uh, from a scientific discussion perspective, in the sense when I look at all the clues that we have right now and we want to make a rational judgment about the universe, it is one of the hypotheses that is right. Second hypothesis being the multiverse. Right? We are part of parallel universes. Every universe has a different... And they'll still have the same laws, but the way they manifest is different. The gravity could be stronger in one of them. Um, I don't know if any of these ideas are at a stage where we would be able to root for them. Like I, as a physicist, have a very, uh, very strong opinion on the fact that, to me, physics is only the things that you could test. Everything else is in the realm of theoretical or mathematical physics. But until and unless there is no observable, it still does not fit the definition. So the reason we I like doing general relativity now than I would have liked, let's say, back in 70s, um, is now is the time when I'm able to test. And now we are able to literally see the skin of the black holes right now, the event horizons. When we see the two black holes are colliding, how they are forming the curve black hole happen, all those hypotheses at that instance, this extreme gravity phenomenon, we're able to look, test, compare. And if in case there are any error bars, that's where you fit the next theory. So the beauty of doing all that right now, oh, uh, I, and I think in this kind of grand cosmological ideas, we are not so close. And specifically, we are not close. We've just went a little further away since dark energy came into the picture. I think now we don't understand some of the grand things in a much... I mean, now it's very obvious that uh, that we need a sort of a higher theory. Okay, now we cannot end, have a discussion about physics where we don't discuss the string theory. So uh, within you know the field of physics, there is this, uh, I don't know how to, I, I don't like to use the word tussle with scientists, but uh, a debate. A debate, a very, you know, a very fierce debate goes on where, you know, there is a certain section uh, within the physics community that says it should not be called a theory, it should be actually called a hypothesis, where because we've not really tested it in any way or form. And then there is the other side, which has now become more and more... Uh, you know, prevalent where they say no it's a string theory and it's very where you know it's perfectly uh, okay to say it's the truth and uh, so for first question where do you stand personally on uh, on this uh, divide whether it's hypothesis or a theory and two uh what do you think is the road ahead uh, in physics uh, in terms of uh, what we always call the grand unified theory right we we want to make sense of everything so where do you stand because of uh, whatever i could understand from the large hadron uh, collider results i was like they didn't even there they could not get definitive results right yeah yeah it's a uh, it's an interesting times in physics now that we have few mega science experiments um, whose results have sort of been out large hadron collider ligo and it has not hinted 
had any deviation from the past theories so far i mean uh, we know things are not right but we have not reached uh, sort of a mathematical structure which is consistently explaining that right uh string is has been the most you know, sort of it's almost like how australia is or was in cricket you know in that 2003 to 12 period right so like they're like we had a big dominating sort of um, uh, group of scientists and dominating in the sense that in sense is a large community of researchers there the alternate to them are also very plausible you know, that is loop quantum gravity uh which i mean the um, penrose and others have always backed uh lee smolin is one of the founders of loop quantum gravity uh by stecker and others because i am from that school of thought i always found uh, loop quantum gravity to be much more um intuitive so you want to so the what's i mean the big thing of our ground unified theory I mean, the very central argument to all this is the quantum behavior of gravity and that is the crux of it right because you know you could have other three together quantum mechanics and the other nuclear forces in in a in a format together because they get derived from the quantum field theory derives from that principle but gr the continuum of space time the smooth space time almost uh, uh that that essential feature is not sort of applicable in the quantum world that you know you could have a continuous time continuous space so you have to discretize it so you have to discretize discretize space time you know that could be the smallest space time after which there is nothing you know like it just jumps so loop quantum gravity promises to do that and when you do in that approach you figure out things like singularity and all which are essentially limitations of human knowledge right now singularity is almost cannot be nature but gr general relativity predicts it uh, but if you had this sort of quantized structures you would be able to um, avoid it and with some other other thing uh, to uh, uh, to come up with it and these things if they could be tested and i mean any theory for that matter on we have experiments billions of dollars of worth decades of making that are running it is a responsibility of theorist to come up with plausible observational proof because you can't have be going on and on like this sort of marxist idea of you know this is the best way of approaching everything <laughs> that this is the way that everything sort of can be explained and this is the only way so yeah i mean that's that's my take on string theory i have nothing against it until unless you have observational features and i've been in vicinity so i've had chats with uh, lenat saskin um and uh, there is of course from india there is a big string community uh, there's ashok sir and all it's all cool stuff uh, but it's not there yet <laughs> and i i and to students who may be watching this you cannot do a phd on these topics i mean if you sh- i mean it's okay to do it but this is not something i've always said this to my students and whoever who have asked me for guidance that you have to work in the era of the science that exists like if you want to find aliens today then you do exoplanet search you don't go ahead and look for like signals that are coming from the cosmos because you'll, you'll spend years and nothing would be there But instead, find how you are looking for planets. I guess if you want to work on theoretical physics, string theory, or I mean, the idea is that you work on large hadron collider kind of an experiment. That is the data. What can you constrain? What can you not constrain from it? Those are the things you want to work on. What can be tested? Okay, one last question to you. Uh, well, I have always seen this, and it's changing now. Uh, you know. science uh, there was a period where scientists you know we had become too specialized in the way science was conducted you know they, if there is someone in physics they would literally you know they would twin point on that particular area and uh, they would only focus in that area and there was no interdisciplinary work 
which which i think uh, uh, is changing now and a lot of scientists are you know getting involved in these uh, you know interdisciplinary fields where you know there might be a physicist on the table there might be a evolutionary biologist at the table and there might be a evolutionary psychologist at the table too and and then they work together and they they we create this sort of a consilience where you know you have uh, you create a nomological network where uh, a point can be proven through multiple disciplines uh, so what is your take on uh, working uh, you know in, in an interdisciplinary manner what, what is your personal view on that oh yeah i mean absolutely that is the beauty of science and being in universities which do research that you can collaborate and work on many other uh, fields and find connections there like i for example i'm benefiting a lot from the work that is being done in computer science departments like whether it is high performance computing how i take my sub codes put it on world's fastest supercomputers Like this is something not physics training teaches you. You have to have collaborations, and now also in this era where you could use machine learning to better identify signals, and that signal could be also gravitational signal. So all those things, you know, I am getting from other disciplines. And for my particular test case of doing astrophysics, and that has to be it. I mean that I am strong proponent that I mean the only institutes in the world that. do great are the one in which researchers collaborate internally i mean there has been instances where i've been in india and uh, some great institutions which i have high regards for um, but the internal conversations between departments uh, almost are not existent uh, and uh, that 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 so i mean you have to take science institutes as also the same kind of corporate training and stuff you give to employees right you have to have some level of you know how they would interact how their efficiency would go for that you have to give this kind of trainings and camps to scientists you have to have hr professional teach us all those things i mean right now actually i just last week i attended a workshop on telling how do i write a better paper and i thought it was like a great thing right i mean i had to sit and you now somewhere write very basic things and there were students who had never written a paper and there were then uh, uh, folks like myself or some of my colleagues who had written a bunch of papers but we all sort of sat down and like looked at basics and had a discussion by someone from an english department telling us how to write papers <laughs> that that's fascinating so karan you've given you know you've given me so much of your time so uh, i want to end the podcast now with uh, i would request you uh, to give a message to everyone who watches this you know to me personally in my life you've been such an inspiration when when i saw you know the name of an indian scientist in such a major discovery uh kya the na wrongte khade ho jana mere liye bahut bade garv ki baat thi and first of all i want to thank you on behalf of each and every indian uh, that thanks a lot you have done this nation proud and you know we've had a lot of moments of pride in this country but we've had a lot of moments of sorrow too and you know in in such a checkered past and in such a dicey present you know when we see people like you making such significant achievements it it really makes us proud so first of all thanks a lot but what would be your message to everybody now that we are going to wrap things up uh, you know what is your message to all the young kids who are going to watch it or probably the elder citizens you know what would you want to tell them in the end oh well, thank you man this kind was really mean a lot to me i mean the only essentially i don't think i have the position to give messages but i mean the dreams that you have at the young age as well don't compromise it at any time I mean, you could always start fresh it's never too late to reach you know to work towards your dreams and that dreams could be anything but if it is in science uh, then go for it you know, forget you know log kya kahenge mentality and just go towards it uh, and that's that's what i've seen anything i can say all right karan uh, once again thanks a lot for agreeing to you know come on my podcast i mean i'm probably a nobody and you know like i said this is my probably one of my more significant moments in my life where i got to talk to someone who is 
significantly more smarter than me and uh, has significant uh, has achieved far more significant uh, things in his life so thanks a lot my dear friend well thank you so much and good luck with your podcast looking forward to it